ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. Let's begin our session. Uh, my guest today is the former Prime Minister of Australia, a position she held from 2010 to 2013, and a former Minister of Education. She was to the first and to date only woman to hold the positions of Deputy Prime Minister, Prime Minister and Leader of a major party in Australia. Since leaving office, Julia has assumed a number of roles, most notably as Chair of the Board of Directors of the Global Partnership for Education, a role she has held since early 2014, making her, I would feel sure you'll agree, the preeminent voice in the global education debate today around ensuring that there is enough financing for every child to have a decent education. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julia Gerrard. Juliet, let's start by talking a little bit about your own life experiences. How did your personal life experiences help shape your passion for education? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, really, for me, it's a story that starts in my family home. So uh, I was born in 1961. That's a long time ago. Um, I was born in uh, Wales in the United Kingdom. Uh, my family and I are migrants to Australia and I came out at a very young age, at the age of four, hence this accent instead of any nice Welsh lilt in my voice, there's none of that. Uh, and you know, the stories in my family home when my parents talked about their childhood uh, were all stories about um, missing out on education and how big an impact that had on them. Uh, my father was one of seven children in a mining family in a coal mining village in South Wales and he left school at 14 uh, because his family literally couldn't afford not to have him working. Even though he'd got a scholarship to get to the end of secondary school, they just needed him at work. And my mother, for a different set of reasons, she grew up in Barry, the sort of port area alongside Cardiff in Wales. Uh, she was very unwell as a child and as a result, um, you know, there was a lot of breaking up of her schooling and no, you know, potential arrangements made to help her stay up to date with her schoolwork. And so she drifted away from school too. They're both very bright people, big readers, um, and had this kind of sense of, you know, what if, what life could have been if, you know, we'd got to finish schooling. And so from a very early age, my sister and I had it drummed into us that education was important, school was important, you should aim high. So against that background, I ultimately got to go to university uh, and there were some big education cutbacks when I was at university and I got involved in a campaign to try and change the government's mind about that. Uh, and so really that's where the value in, in me about education and fighting for its resourcing and fighting for educational equity comes from. Fantastic. So you, you, you graduated, went into politics, became Minister of Education, became, as I said in my introduction, first female Prime Minister of Australia. I think it's it safe to say... It sounds easy when you put it, it, it like that. It sounds very straightforward. <laughs> a seamless plan, yeah, I'm sure. Just... I mean, I think it's fairly safe to say that during your time as Prime Minister, you faced some scrutiny which a lot of people would say veered towards misogyny. Uh, and so I know that you're, you're acutely aware of issues around women's rights and girls' rights. And thinking about particularly in education, why is it that as we sit here in 2018, we are still talking about the need for particular focus on girls. Why is it that girls are still less likely to be educated? Why is it that girls are still less likely to have money spent on them? Mm. Well, I guess we're uh, talking about every child's right to education, and I think it should break all of our hearts that there are more than 260 million children of primary and secondary school age who aren't in school as we're sitting here now. Uh, but you're right, the face of disadvantage is most likely to be a female face. And I think that's a series of things. Um, you know, when very poor families have to make decisions about um, who's going to go to school and who's going to get held at home to perhaps look after younger children or uh, help with household chores to free up an adult to go and do something that might generate income and pay for food. Um, in many societies, when that choice is weighed up, it's the boy that gets sent to school and the girl who stays home. Uh, in many societies, it's not safe or not viewed as safe to send your girl to school. Um, schools aren't around the corner. They're many, many miles walk away and the journey is not a safe journey. And in many societies, the uh, preconception uh, is that, you know, girls will marry, perhaps potentially marry very young. Uh, and so what do they need the education for? And, you know, I mean, we 
you know, I'm old enough uh, to remember a time where in our own societies that was a predisposition about girls. I mean, uh, being born in 1961, I did my schooling in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and when I did secondary school, you know, we got divided up uh, for one subject stream, girls and boys, and the boys studied a term of woodwork, a term of metalwork, uh, and a term of electronics, and we study a term of cooking, a term of sewing, and a term of laundry, uh, because we were being prepared to be housewives. So, I mean, you know, um, that's in Australia in the 1970s uh, that I was in secondary school. Uh, so, you know, a lot has changed in our societies. We're not any, by no means perfect yet, but it's lots changed about perceptions of female education. Uh, but in many places in the world, there would still be the sense that it's a wasted investment because girls will be brides and mothers mm. uh, rather than engaged in the workforce. And so there's a lot to do to make sure that education is, you know, resourced for everyone. Um, very uh, small changes like having school feeding programs or small cash transfer programs can encourage families to send girls to school. Uh, making sure the journey to school is safe and being at school is safe can make a real difference. And explaining this vision of women's economic empowerment about how different a life their daughter will live if she's educated, all of this matters to change the picture. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I, I remember when I was at school, I, I did a term of woodwork as a boy, but I was absolutely terrible at it. So maybe a term <laughs> of, term of uh, laundry and cooking would have been better for me. I think probably my wife would agree with that as well. Um, let's talk about the GPE, uh, which is your, your big passion at the moment, and, and as I say, the thing that you're, you're really notable for now. Can you just explain to people a little bit about what it is that the GPE exists to do? Sure. Well, we uh, exist uh, to try and solve that challenge of, you know, more than 260 million children out of school, but also, too, to solve the challenge of quality that in many developing countries, uh, whilst kids are getting access to school, the quality is so poor that at the end of primary school, kids still can't write a sentence or do even the most basic maths. Uh, and our model of change is to work with a nation to strengthen the whole education system, which starts with a great quality plan. Um, and it might sound like a simple, even a mundane task to be planning school systems. And many people in this room, uh, you know, teachers and others, uh, probably look at the education bureaucracies in their state or their nation and think the last thing we need is someone else bloody labouring on a plan. Uh, we, you know, we're already uh, micro-programmed and bureaucratised to the max. Uh, but in many of the countries in which we work, uh, there has never been a, a comprehensive plan for schooling. So you get uh, patchy coverage, fragmentation, waste, uh, all of the things that happen when you don't have a good quality plan. Um, we do that uh, with 67 developing countries around the world, around two-thirds in Africa, but in other places as well. And then for the lowest income countries, we fund a section of the delivery of the plan. Uh, so it is about um, making a difference for children, it's about capacity building uh, in the nation, uh, it's about knowledge sharing, so what is working in one nation can be shared in another nation. Uh, so it's truly a partnership that brings together donors, developing countries, civil society, teachers and teacher unions, private philanthropy, the private sector, the multilateral institutions like the World Bank, members of the UN family, all coming together to try and bear down on this task of strengthening education systems. It's interesting you use the word partnership, because of course you're right, it is a, it is a partnership, but... Do you think there's a risk, I mean, if you look at the list of donor countries to GPE, for example, it essentially reads like a who's who of the global north. And as you said, you work with 67 countries of which two thirds are in, in sub-Saharan Africa and Africa. Do you think there's a risk that GPE could be perceived as a sort of, you know, global north helping sort out the global south? Look, there's, there's always that risk, um, but what, what we find, because we stress partnership so much, uh, is that uh, it's, it's not uh, perceived by developing countries as, you know, the donors coming along and giving some money but only if they can tell the developing country what to do. Uh, it is perceived as a genuine partnership. And I think our recent financing conference, which we had in uh, Senegal in February, 
where we raise $2.3 billion in donor funds for the next three years and where developing countries pledged $110 billion of domestic expenditure. I think that, that conference sort of symbolised partnership. Um, it was a financing conference for a global partnership, a global fund, held not in the global north, but in a developing country. It was a financing conference that was co-hosted by President Saleh of Senegal and President Macron of France. So in that, showing that you know, th this is a genuine bringing together um, of uh, developing countries and donors in a spirit of partnership. Um, and I can um, see uh, David in the audience who served on our board for a long period of time. Hello, from civil society. Uh, if I didn't at this point, uh, at this stage, make the point that when we're talking about education financing, the donor funds are important and, you know, I'll always be there advocating for more donor funds, but actually the biggest amount of money spent on education in developing countries comes from those developing countries themselves. And our financing conference showed that, our work shows that, so if you're only thinking about it as Global North gives donations, you're actually missing out on more than 90% of the financing. And if you want every dollar to have an impact, then you want to look at that whole pool of international flows and domestic financing and make sure we're against a great quality plan that it's expended for the most impact. So you're anticipating my next question, uh, which is, as you say, in, in Senegal, so 2.3 billion from donors, but as you say, completely dwarfed by 110 billion commitment from the developing countries themselves. What, what's your priority? What, what do you want to do with that money over the next period? Well, because uh, it is genuinely a partnership and it's a country-led development model, that will depend country by country and place by place. Um, in some of the countries in which we work, uh, for example, uh, last year uh, I went to Malawi with our global ambassador, Rihanna, and we uh, looked at schools there and talked to the government, talked to civil society and others. I mean, they're still solving. Uh, access challenges are certainly, um, you know, faced with quality challenges. I mean, the likelihood of a girl finishing 12 years of schooling in Malawi is one in 10. Uh, you know, most actually won't make the transition from primary school to secondary school. Uh, the school is, you know, likely to be uh, a mud brick constructed building that was made by the village. It won't have electricity, it won't have bathrooms, it won't have running water. Uh, teachers are, you know, untrained or have only had the benefit of a relatively short amount of training. Uh, there isn't textbooks, there isn't learning materials available, so huge challenges. Uh, but then, you know, at the other, you know, other parts of Africa, other parts of the world, you know, my own region of the world, countries like uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia are in the Global Partnership for Education and they've made some big strides mm. forward in their education systems. So none of this is one size fits all. It's where are we in the cycle of development and what needs to happen next for that schooling system. Yeah, and, and I mean, Vietnam is a, is a really good example, actually, of a country that's made terrific strides uh, in education recently. I'm interested in, in your perspective as to why you think, given the importance of, of education financing and given the success of the partnership in, uh, and given the success of Senegal, why is it that if you take the Education Commission data, for example, Education aid is a kind of at best flatlining, whereas health aid, climate change aid, civil society aid is, is rapidly going off the charts. Why is it that you think from a world leader perspective, be they developing countries or developed countries or a philanthropic perspective or a corporate CSR perspective, why do you think it is that education aid has, has dropped off the agenda a little mm. bit? Well, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that because there's been a shift in momentum around education that, you know, in the next few years when we do those aid statistics, we'll have seen that, um, you know, change. Um, but I, I think there's a, a few reasons why education kind of has lagged behind. Um, number one, uh, I think uh, in the Millennium Development Goal era, in the early part of that era, after the year 2000, there was a lot of energy around health. Now, partly that was uh, the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic galvanising global action, as well it should. Uh, partly that was the engagement of at-scale philanthropy, most particularly Bill Gates, 
Um, and partly it was the development of new models of engagement, you know, how can we get the price of vaccines down so that they can be afforded for every child in the world rather than just being um, in, uh, you know, the global north. Um, so a lot of energy. At the same time, there was, I think, a loss of faith in the Millennium Development Goal for Education. It was an access measure for primary school and it became apparent pretty quickly that some countries were achieving universal access to primary school by eradicating school fees and opening the doors, which I think we'd all say is a good thing, but actually not putting any more resources in the system. So you went from classes of 30 or 40 to classes of 80 or 90 and no one was learning. So I think that told and education started to lag behind. Now, of course, the sustainable development goal is both access and quality, and we've all been talking about quality for a, a long period of time now. Um, number two, in the cycle of politics, I think uh, governments uh, spend taxpayers' funds on overseas development aid. Uh, it's not a charitable world in many ways for the domestic politics around that. And so the quicker you can show demonstrable results back to your taxpayers, the better. Um, and education often loses out in that battle because it's a patient investment. You know, you might be able to put money into uh, the Global Vaccine Alliance and at the end of 12 months say, as a result of our nation's investment, you know, 10 million children have been immunised. Uh, in education, that would be, uh, you know, kids have gone to school for the first year of what we're hoping will be a 12-year cycle, like it's a very patient story. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, I, I sometimes think as an education community, we've spent a lot of time talking ourselves down. Mm. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of dialogue about, you know, uh, we, we don't know uh, how to educate children. And, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware that we always want to be learning from each other and getting better and better, and the world our kids are going to live in is a different world, and hence conferences like this, you know, education for 2030, lots of things to think about. But we shouldn't be sending the message globally that we don't know how to solve the problem of getting every child into school. We do know how to yeah. solve that problem. Yeah. If we had the resources, that is a soluble problem. Yeah. Um, now, it wouldn't mean that we'd walk away and go, job done, because in the same way that our schools are different today than the schools I went to in the 1960s and 1970s, education always needs to keep reforming. Uh, but we could roll out schooling for every child in the world tomorrow if we put our mind to it. Yeah. So let's not present this to the global community as a challenge beyond uh, the wit of human beings to mm -hmm. solve. Uh, so we can't keep talking ourselves down. We shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, and I think that last point you make is, is absolutely the right one because we, we do as an education community sometimes do ourselves down and we do say it's very difficult and, and, and we don't know how to improve the quality of schools and we don't know how to teach children how to read. And actually that, that isn't true. We, we do know there are some things which are you, not you know perfectly transferable to do with the way the human brain learns, for example, that whether you're in a, a mud brick school in Malawi or a, a, a you know, a fancy school in Switzerland, you are essentially teaching the same children the same basic structures. And one of the things I've always been very struck by is, is on this quality agenda, which is uh, I want to come to. As you say, we've, been, we've moved away from talking about access to talking about quality, but yet on top of the 265 million kids in school, there's another several hundred million in school and not learning. I mean, surely that's, that's completely unacceptable, but yet we don't really seem to be doing the things which... I think you and I would both say could be proven to do something about it. Uh, I think I think uh, it's it's a differential picture. I think uh, some of the things uh, we know would improve it are being done, uh, but then you do hit resource and capacity constraints. Um, I served on uh, the Education Commission, which was led by Gordon Brown, uh, and which the Prime Minister of Norway, Prime Minister Solberg, was so pivotal to creating. Uh, and that, uh, very well assisted by uh, Lisbeth Steer, formerly of Brookings, and a number of other researchers, uh, actually identified some of the sort of best buys in education, the things that are most effective for change. And they're, they're listed there in that report. Uh, and that, you know, does have implications for how we work with developing countries on the planning task. Um, you know, we do know how to make a difference. Um, and if we systematically rolled those things out, then we would be um, helping 
with that quality challenge. Now, part of that quality challenge also arises because of workforce constraints. Um, here, we're here in part to celebrate um, some uh, you know, wonderful teachers, absolute excellence in teaching, global leadership in teaching, and hello to the Aussies in the audience uh, who are all, all part of that. Um, I, should, I should just say other teacher nationalities are available. Yeah, there, there are other teacher nationalities here too. Um, but, you know, in many parts of the world, uh, you know, people are being uh, taught uh, by someone who's got, had no training and is getting zero support. Um, so, you know, should we be surprised um, that uh, they are struggling uh, to offer children a quality education? So the workforce constraint is a, an important challenge to overcome. Yeah. One of the things I'm, I'm very struck by about the, the way that the GPE model works, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, was the way in which you sort of offer technical assistance and sort of monitor the implementation. And in particular, I think I'm right in saying that you sort of use a results-based, a sort of results-based financing model in part. Now, that is a, a very problematic concept in a lot of education policy, uh, not least, you know, talking about teachers and teacher evaluation models. Very often, kind of results-based financing, performance-based pay hasn't worked. What's been your experience with using results-based financing through GPE? Well, the way uh, we use results-based financing, so I'd, firstly, it's pivotal to the GPE model that if you're going to qualify for one of our grants, uh, that as a developing country, you have to be increasing your own expenditure on education. So it's not a substitution where GPE money goes in and some domestic mm -hmm. resources go out. It's got to be growing. And then 30% of our grant uh, can be made uh, contingent on achieving agreed benchmarks, and they'll be different for different countries, uh, in things like learning. Um, and, you know, that, that model uh, was worked on uh, around the GPE board table and agreed to uh, by all of our, um, you know, big multilateral partnership, including the developing country partners. I, th I think sometimes when we look at these issues in developing countries, we've got to be a little bit careful that we're not uplifting our, um, you know, Australian or UK or whatever it is, US education debate and putting it down in a developing country and pretending it fits. Um, you know, uh, in Australia, uh, people would spend a lot of time talking about crowded curriculum. Um, <coughs> And you know, there's no way in the world that you would go to a low-income country in Africa or Asia and have parents bailing you up to talk about the principal challenge being crowded curriculum. Like, not going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we uh, and I, I kicked off a whole round of this um, in in Australia. Uh, you know, we had uh, national testing for literacy and numeracy and transparency of results and uh, all of that. Uh, causes lots of debates within the Australian education system. Um, really, uh, I don't see those kind of debates being replicated in many of our developing country partners who are so acutely aware of the quality challenges uh, that they do want uh, assistance with assessment and testing, which leads to you know more information for their policy making, more information about teachers, for teachers about what needs to be done to increase quality. Um, and, you know, uh, performance-based pay and many of the other things that we talk about, you know, aren't really alive in these environments either. So we, we just got to be careful we're not kind of plucking our anxieties and putting them down in places that they don't really apply. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's absolutely right. And then, and then, of course, alongside your sort of results-based financing, you have this sort of concept of social accountability, which you talk quite a lot about. Can you explain a little bit about, more about what you mean by that and, and how that operates in practice? Yeah, we, um, you know, one of the reasons it's so important for us to have civil society at the table, and that's not just at the GPE board table, but in our developing country partners, this planning task um, is government-led, but in, in engagement with what we call a local education group, which has civil society at the table. Uh, the reason we think that's so important is you know, it is uh, community representative civil society actors that will help create the political space within countries for there to be greater investments in education. And it is those actors who will often give the most accurate information and account 
about what is actually happening in communities, whether money is landing as it should and making a difference as it should. And if you don't have that kind of civil society engagement, then you won't get uh, the mutual accountability that's necessary to drive a partnership like ours. And, and so you find that that sort of blend of, I guess, what you might call sort of harder accountability and softer accountability, that, that's what you think is, that's the secret sauce? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think, unfortunately, I don't think there's one secret source in education, <laughs> but if I was going to go all Kentucky Fried and come up with 11 herbs and spices or something, um, uh, though we say KFC in the modern age, don't we? I think, I think it's one of, uh, one of those one herbs of the, one and of the spices. Um, you know, uh, in, in many of the nations in which we work, uh, you know, the government, uh, the, the real economy is still quite thin. Um, government revenues are consequently quite thin because when you tax not very much, it ends up being not very much. Um, demands for development are huge. Uh, and so you imagine being around that cabinet table where the Minister for Health is understandably saying we're still trying to combat maternal mortality. Uh, the Minister for Transport is understandably saying roads are impassable in two thirds of the country during the wet season. Uh, the Minister for Communications is understandably saying, um, you know, unless we do something we, uh, about our connectivity, then we're not going to be able to uh, attract international investment. All incredibly legitimate, all competing for funds. And there's the Education Minister. Uh, now, civil society campaigning and engagement can help um, change that picture and help people understand that all the rest of it actually becomes pretty notional if you're not investing in education because that's the long-term secret to development and prosperity. Uh, and so it is absolutely one of the key ingredients for us. Now, we're here at this conference this weekend talking about the world in 2030. Uh, and as uh, we, we talked about a little bit earlier in my previous session, you know, when the Varkey Foundation put out a survey of parents and we asked parents how well they think schools are preparing their children for 2030, Actually, by a two-to-one majority, parents said they thought schools were, um, which is not always the sort of the impression you get when you when you sort of debate these issues. So, our survey suggested that parents do think. What, what what's your take? Do you think that on the whole, schools are preparing children for the world of 2030? Uh, I think I think I'd be a little bit more critical than the parents obviously are. Um, I look. I think our schools, um, you know. If I think about Australian schools, I think we get a hell of a lot right, a hell of a lot right. But um, I would be concerned for our schools and more generally around the world that we haven't made the full transition from being uh, content <coughs> transferers, uh, what, what's in the teacher's head through a process getting into the head of the students, um, content transferers as opposed to uh, enablers uh, creating global citizens who will have the skills and capacities to keep learning in an incredibly, um, you know, changing world. And, you know, uh, I I'm well and truly remember, um, you know, the, the time before smartphones. I remember being, I used to be a lawyer before I was in politics. I remember when we first got the fax machine. Um, you know, what a miracle. You could stick a sheet of paper and it went and it turned up somewhere else, like incredible. <laughs> um, uh, and you, you think how much change, uh, you know, I've lived through um, in the course of my working life, which is nowhere near over. Um, and then you think the rate of that change, Moore's law and all the rest of it, uh, the pace of it is increasing exponentially. And so, you know, the kids that come out of school in 2030, so you could be starting school now, as Vickers said to us this morning, coming out of 12 years of schooling in 2030, by the time they're 40 in 2050, um, you know, or near 40, um, what, what's the world going to look like um, for them? What, what's, where's artificial intelligence going to be at? What's the next uh, era of uh, communications technology? Um, you know, what's the next era of robotics? 
uh, what's the next era of uh, you know democratic management for nation states going to look like? What's the next era of uh, global uh, interconnections uh, in terms of uh, you know sort of global governance and structures going to look like? Uh, what's climate and the natural environment going to look like? Um, you know. The, they, they will live in a dramatically changed world, so are we giving them all the skills and capacities they'll need for that? I'm not so sure. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's open it up for some questions. Uh, who has a question they'd like to ask? The gentleman there, have we got a microphone? I can say it all loud. <laughs> Go on, shout out, shout out loud then. Thank you, Prime Minister Dillard, for a fascinating talk. You mentioned Niger and Malawi. Going for, and you also mentioned going from millennial development Okay, we'll just we'll just take we'll take the questions in it in, in, okay. in a bunch if that's okay. No uh, so the gentleman there, and then the woman over there, and then we'll come back. Hi there, uh, David Archer from Action Aid. Um, as always, delighted to hear um, so much about how things are moving with GPE. I do think the story about how GPE has leveraged domestic financing needs to be really put front and centre because I think a lot of the global health funds have added, actually led to a displacement of domestic funding. And I think this is something where we can see education really at the forefront and actually being better at achieving systemic change and long-term predictable funding <coughs> that will come from a, a domestic sources in the long term. I do think there's a big challenge for GPE, however, in only focusing at the moment on the share of the budget spent on education because that sets us up in competition with other sectors who are also looking to increase the share of the budget. We need to get much more serious on expanding the domestic tax base, which will be a collective win for all of the different sectors. And GPE could play a groundbreaking role in the coming years in making uh, that progress on the domestic tax base a central part of its dialogue with Ministers of Finance and Ministers of Education. What more can you do as the chair of GPE <laughs> to make that happen? Okay, and then there was a yeah, woman, woman over there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would like to know what you'll do differently in this new cycle of funding compared to what you did before. And you talked about um, education being you know, a long-term investment. With your funding to the country, is about, I think it's three years per cycle. How do you think you can see change if you're only going to be funding three years uh, per cycle? Another, another question, will you be uh, looking at um, investing more in education in conflict areas or you know, in emergencies? Because we heard today it's only 2% of the funding that goes to humanitarian aid that goes to education. So how can we tackle that if we're talking about development? Okay, so four Thank pretty you. straightforward questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, what, what I might do is start and, and, and sweep back. Um, uh, currently, uh, almost half of what uh, GPE does is in uh, fragile and conflict-affected countries. Uh, and uh, we work with uh, those nations on you know, uh, acute problems. I mean, to give you an example, uh, Chad is a GPE country. It's seen huge refugee inflows, um, wanted to include those refugee children uh, in their, you know, in their education system. Obviously, Chad is a very poor country, uh, but did want to extend education to those refugee children, and we've worked with Chad on doing that. Um, so, uh, we... Uh, we also uh, work with Education Cannot Wait, uh, which is the fund that's been created uh, to uh, respond in the first instance to humanitarian emergencies and was uh, created at the World Humanitarian Summit a couple of years ago. So we work in very strong uh, dialogue and partnership with them. On continuity of funding, uh, our major grants are on uh, four-year cycles. Uh, but uh, we, you know, we stay engaged with countries, sort of plan after plan, grant after grant. So it's not a project mo modality where you might be there for two years and then go away entirely. Uh, we stay engaged and with countries until they 
graduate from GPE membership because their education systems have got so strong. Um, on how all of this relates to, uh, you know, taxation, I mean, uh, there are things GPE can do and things we can't do. We're not going to become a, a tax research, uh, you know, taxation systems uh, place. That's beyond our remit and our expertise. But we can certainly advocate uh, that as the world is talking about uh, the, the ability for uh, major corporations to move money uh, out of jurisdictions in a way that prevents them being appropriately taxed, uh, that that is not only a conundrum for you know, countries like Australia, et cetera, when we're talking about taxing major global corporations, it's a very big challenge for developing countries. So we can advocate for proper taxation systems and global arrangements, but the technical expertise would need to be provided by others. And, you know, I, I, mean, I agree with you that, you know, we want to see uh, the full range of the sustainable development agenda um, come true by 2030, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I do know uh, from the, you know, my own region of the world, um, obviously I've travelled extensively um, uh, in, in Asia, um, did that as Australian Prime Minister and before I was Prime Minister. And when you go to a country like uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, when you go to Singapore, and you actually imagine those countries at the end of World War II, in the case of Singapore or the Korean War, um, uh, people, you know, countries destroyed, uh, bombed, destroyed by warfare, Singapore Harbour uh, choked by uh, ships that had been sunk, uh, starving uh, populations who were, you know, trying basically to keep everybody alive. Uh, what did those countries invest in? which explains their domestic prosperity now, they invested in education. Uh, because as grim as things were, and even while they were trying to cater for people's immediate needs, they recognised that the only way out uh, was basically education and the creation of modern economies. And both of them have done that in absolute uh, spades. So, you know, uh, uh, South Korea, a G20 nation, and Singapore, a very prosperous place. Um, so, you know, it seems to me, whilst we want every part of sustainable development to be resourced, we also do need to be pretty clear about what the enabling factors are for change, and education is most assuredly an enabling factor. Okay, very good. Let's uh, do another round of questions. The lady there, gentleman at the back there, and then the gentleman at the front there. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and plans, and I especially appreciate that you mentioned the role and contribution of civil society. And there is an issue about that that I would like to share with you and to hear your thoughts about that. Um, I'm talking about the education of adults, and I will mention 800 million fully illiterate adult people around the globe. When I say fully illiterate, it means not being able to read or write a single sentence around three billion estimations from UNESCO functionally illiterate. Of course, it does have a dimension, the dimension that influences uh, edu um, uh, Agenda 2030, poverty reduction, gender uh, equity, and so on. But in our context, so I talk about those people as parents. Since we are talking about financing children education, so those parents who are fully illiterate, they won't be able to help their children with the school tasks, they won't be uh, ready or motivated to support them in their learning. They will arrange early marriages. They won't be able to create learning environment. So I think it will jeopardize very much all the efforts that we do on children educa children's education. So uh, is it possible then to work on children's education without investing in parents' education? How can we do it best parallel? At the moment, this is the burden that is mostly cared, uh, uh, carried by uh, civil society, which is quite a lot. Okay. So if I would appreciate if you would comment on that. Thank you very much. The second question, I can't remember why I went the gentleman at the back there in the white shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Williams. I'm from the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award Foundation. Uh, we champion non-formal education across 130 countries we operate in. 
Um, my question's about how much emphasis the, the GPE puts on, on formal education, the power of, of it to, to raise educational attainment. Um, all our evidence and data suggests it does, uh, particularly amongst um, uh, government schools in, in, in the developing world. So just we're, we're conscious it's absent from the debate, and we're wondering whether um, the GPE takes it seriously. Okay, thank you very much. And then the third question was the gentleman there. Thank you, and Julia, I'm principal of a uh, school in uh, Hastings in Victoria, which I know you'll know well. And uh, for us, uh, one of the differences we're experiencing at the moment is um, a legacy of your government, which was um, disadvantaged in needs-based funding, which has been phenomenal and fantastic, and I want to say thank you for, for that, because it's a real legacy for us, which we really appreciate. Um, I'm wondering, though, how, given what we heard this morning and, and your role now in seeing what we describe as disadvantage being completely different. How do you get that balance right you know, in, in the way we move forward? And is, is there more that countries like Australia do? Is, is that balance just out of sync now, given what you had set up there and, and what you see now? And should we be doing, doing things differently? Because when you sort of said about countries not as um, uh, giving as much to that, that education, what you're seeing, is it perhaps because countries are more inwardly focused on getting that disadvantage right in their own countries? But is that at the greater expense of how um, that those children uh, you know, experience um, so little now? Thank okay, you. Julia. Um, yeah, ha happy to take uh, all of those questions. I mean, uh, we, we at the Global Partnership for Education need to be very clear about what we do and what is beyond our remit and which we can't resource. And so um, we are focused on uh, school education and the sort of uh, early childhood education immediately before school. Um, we don't extend out into informal education or into adult education. So we've got to be very, you know, uh, it's a sounds like a lot of money, $2.3 billion, but given the dimensions of the task, it's actually a very, very modest resource base uh, and we've got to be very forensic about it. So. Um, obviously, we would applaud uh, the efforts of others who are engaged in adult literacy, informal education, but that's not what we do. Um, on, on this issue of uh, disadvantage, um, I think uh, when, when you look right around the world, um, within countries, without special efforts, it will be the most disadvantaged kids who get left behind. And that's not because they can't um, excel and uh, get the benefits of a great education, it's that it takes more resources. And uh, many nations, uh, even uh, nations that are, you know, at the top um, of, uh, you know, global rankings in terms of income per capita, uh, would still operate models that are of school funding that are basically uh, per capita models rather than trying to fund for disadvantage and so that's the move we made in Australia and you know I think that's a vital move for countries right around the world. Uh, then when we get to the question of global disadvantage um, you know I think we've got to come at this task with a spirit of gener generosity. Um, it's not easy for governments to balance budgets, it's not easy for governments to make decisions about how much money goes into foreign aid as opposed to other purposes. Um, but, you know, I think we can all, in a very interconnected world, uh, see the benefits of investing uh, in development. Um, you know, people might think they can kind of build walls or whatever. Uh, and keep the rest of the world away, but actually in this globally connected world, life doesn't work like that. Um, and so if we want to see, you know, the maximum global prosperity, the biggest global economy, uh, the maximum uh, prospects for peace and stability, uh, the maximum uh, we can achieve in terms of health care, um, you know, education's got benefits throughout all of those, and they're all issues that don't stop at nation-state borders. All right, I suspect we could carry on going for a long time, but I think we're going to have to leave it there. Can I ask you to show your appreciation then for Julia Gillard? Thank you, Thank you very much.
So that concludes, uh, that was the final session of the conference today. There are other ones running in parallel. Please do go to the cocktail evening at the Nassimi Beach later tonight, and we look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow for the start of the closing plenary. Thank you very much.